this computer. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this 12th anniversary of the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster. I'm Laura Feldman, and I'll be your host today. Um, this is an especially important time to remember. As the Japanese government is preparing this year, despite much opposition, to release tons of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. So to help us understand the challenges and health risks of communities most impacted by this crisis, we will be talking with Norma Field, Fukushima expert and one of my most cherished mentors. I also want to thank Yukio Kawano, another cherished mentor who was unable to join us today for her help in preparing this interview. You can find her work, some of her work, on yukiokawano.com. Um, thanks to Columbia Riverkeeper uh, for giving us this platform. We are so grateful. And this interview will appear on their blog. And questions, uh, since this is a recorded interview, if you have questions, you can submit them to some, Simone Anter at Columbia Riverkeeper, and she will forward them to Norma, and Norma will respond to you. And Simone's email is simone at columbiariverkeeper.org. So let's begin with a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> we are on stolen land, the traditional village sites of the Clackamas, Chinook, the Wasco Wishram, the Willamette Tumwater, the Multnomah, and other Chinookan peoples, as well as the Tualatin, Kalapuya, the Cayuse, the Malala, and other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. We acknowledge the economic and social values, including systemic racism, classism, and the disregard for indigenous, black, and immigrant communities that made harm to this place possible. We recognize the need for reparation and healing and strive to learn from and support indigenous communities in their efforts to steward life here for future generations. We are honored to be guests upon these lands and we honor with gratitude the land itself. And now I'm going to introduce Norma Field. She is retired from the University of Chicago in 2012. She is the author of In the Realm of the Dying Emperor, Japan at Century's End. She has followed the Fukushima nuclear disaster from its inception and is the editor and co-translator of Fukushima Radiation, Will You Say No Crime Has Been Committed? It's a collection of statements by 50 complainants, ages seven through 87, about their experience of the disaster and their reasons for wanting a criminal trial. As a member of CORE, Consequences of Radiation Exposure, Field helped, Norma helped organize the Nagasaki Hanford Bridge Project in 2018. She is currently working on a book on the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And I'm very glad for that because as we prepared for this, there, we just realized how much there is to say. And so I'm glad she's working on a book. Um, Norma has visited Fukushima multiple times since, since March 11, 2011. In November of 2022, she visited for the first time since the pandemic began. She has helped draw attention to the 311 Fund for Children with Thyroid Cancer, as well as 311 Children's thyroid cancer lawsuit. Donations to both groups are most welcome and the criminal trial of three TEPCO executives made possible by the determined effort of citizens who became complainants. This helps fund um, this, this, this trial. So with that, I'm going to jump off with um, a statement re Norman recently made about Fukushima today. The government of Japan is moving towards new reactor building and extending the licenses of old ones and breaking down the wall between regulator and regulator. In other words, to affect a 180 degree turn in policy. It took less than 12 years to renounce the lessons of Fukushima, making it look like it never happened. And with that, I give you Norma. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I too want to thank the Columbia Riverkeeper um, for giving us this platform today. 
I'm so grateful to have Laura be my interlocutor. There is so much I want to share with you, and I'm counting on Laura to um, uh, to stop me when I'm not clear. And since this isn't live, though, I hope you will send in questions uh, to Simone at Columbia Riverkeeper, and um, just just to be an interlocutor, um, an active, caring interlocutor. So thank you so much, Laura. And in the spirit of, um, of her land acknowledgement, um, which I, I'm very moved by to listen to, I wanted to share um, one that I'm borrowing from. So let me start sharing my screen. And I will go to slideshow. And since I'm... Um, Talking to you from Chicago, I want to share this. This is a, a from the Architecture uh, Center uh, website, so I'm borrowing it. But this is something I saw a couple of years ago in the summer. And you have to imagine that looking at this, your back is toward um, the Apple store. So very, very uh, glittering part of Chicago. And I happened to walk and just came upon this very large banner saying you are on Potawatomi land. And it was, it was transformational just in this space to see those words there. Um, I understand that um, this banner will be up for a number of years. Of course, we need to do so much more than to um, name the land we are all, um, the, the people of the land we are standing on, using, exploiting but it is so good to have this reminder and to have it in the center of the city and to have it in the center of the place where tourists go. So, um, and, and I, I also always loved the name of our host, the Columbia River Keeper. So I wanted to share this image of the Chicago River as well. Okay, um, Fukushima, what happened? Um, I think, I will stop sharing for a moment and just remind you of, of some of the, um, the TV and video images you might have seen uh, back in 2011 now, almost a dozen years ago. And I want to say also that for people in Fukushima, March is a hard month. You know, they start feeling it um, like late February that because it was, it's, it was trauma. And the residue of trauma will be help, felt for so long. So even as I start speaking to you about it, I'm feeling a little bit what happens in my friend's bodies in Fukushima when we get into the month of March. And 12 years later, isn't diminishing things because in so many ways, um, things are more serious. We know more. We know more about neglect and denial. We know about bioaccumulation. So I just would like you to keep that in mind um, as, as I try to share some things with you today. So at 2.46 in the afternoon, there was this enormous, enormous earthquake. And everybody but everybody knows that time of day, 2.46 in the afternoon. And I suppose we should be grateful it wasn't at night. Uh, when people would have been more, uh, it would have been it would have hampered their movements even more. Um, in, in over the next several days, the the reactor cores of three reactors melted down, reactors one, two, and three, and hydrogen explosions took place at reactors one, three, and four. Now, um, these reactors are clustered. And I can just say another word about that. It's about the politics of citing nuclear power plants. It is so. It has been so hard. Someone I really respect, um, nuclear engineer of Kyoto University, said, "In fact, Japan. In Japan, more nuclear reactor sightings have been refused successfully than granted." So that's always surprising to me, but that's why we have these reactors that are close together, creating more danger, because once you've gotten a community to think your way, then you don't want to keep, you want to capitalize on that. And that's why we have hydrogen. I mean, all of these things are in very close space. 
And then there was that confusing period, right? You've seen the tsunami. You've seen amazing things like boats turning up on land, looking surprised like the humans. You've seen cars swallowed. You see terrible, you hear terrible, terrible stories and anguish stories about parents having to let go of their children's hands when the tsunami comes. And, and in some ways, those stories overwhelm the nuclear reactor meltdowns at first. Um, there, you know, a tragedy is a tragedy, so I don't want to slight anything. But in that first period, the government gave very confusing information. At first, it was a two mile radius uh, from the reactor where you were supposed to evacuate. And then it became um, 10 kilometers or three times as much, about six miles, 7.5 miles, something like that. And then um, 20, 12.5 miles evacuation. So successive, um, um, successive, success, successively expanding concentric circles. Let's also remember that radioactivity does not travel in, in tidy concentric circles. So there's something quite artificial and convenient about this. We should also remember that when finally the Japanese government settles on the 12.5 mile evacuation, Gregory Yatsko, then the head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, told American citizens to get away to a 50 mile, right? 12.5 miles versus 50 miles. Later, very controversial because of course it's inconvenient for the Japanese government to have a US authority recommending much more drastic action. Yasko later, I think he has a book called uh, Confessions of a Rogue Nuclear Regulator, comes to see that nuclear power is not a reasonable thing to way to generate electricity. So explosions, very alarming explosions, people trying, rushing to get away. One of the things we saw then is that you may very well and very sensibly decide to get away, but it's going to be hard. Why? Traffic jams, people not having enough gas. The, 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 the correct decision to get away is not always going to be feasible to execute. That is one of the lessons learned. Um, and also March 11th that night, and the government issued a declaration of a nuclear emergency. That declaration is still in place. The Tokyo Olympics took place under a declaration of nuclear emergency. Uh, people are being asked to go back with a nuclear emergency still in place. Why is that happening? Why has the government not seen, since it's repeatedly announced, there have been so many announcements, right, about how everything is under control, Fukushima, Japan, Fukushima's under control and Japan is back. Um, and yet they have never been able to lift the declaration of nuclear emergency. Myself, I think it, it's, it allows for um, under certain international norms like the uh, ICRP, International Commission for Radi Radiological Protection. It allows the government to tolerate higher levels of exposure uh, and say it's safe for citizens to go back now by using um, the standards that apply during an emergency rather than what the ordinary public is supposed to be asked to tolerate. So that right now, Fukushima citizens, unlike the rest of the citizens of Japan, are asked to consider um, uh, radiation dose in air. That's a clumsy title, but what's important is they're asked to tolerate um, dosage that is 20 times higher than is the case for the public and the rest of Japan. So one millisievert per year versus 20 millisieverts per year in Fukushima. Um, people have tried to say that, that is unconstitutional. It hasn't worked yet. Um, what else do I want to, oh, and March 16th. So five days later, the chief cabinet secretary, Mr. Edano, started to say there is no threat of immediate effects on the body. That is something everybody remembers and many people resent because no immediate effects. Well, what do you mean by that, right? When are we gonna start seeing effects? Shouldn't we be worried? 
But what does it reflect? I think there are a number of things going on. There was genuine lack of information. There was a desire to withhold information. For example, there was a super duper computer program that Japan had developed on its own, very expensive, to, to um, forecast radiation levels. That information was shared with the US military, but not Japanese citizens. That kind of thing happened. Um, and there's also the patronizing and self-serving notion that we don't want people to, cause, to, be, to panic because that will make everything worse. So let's just remember that, that from the beginning, there was enormous, um, let's say life-threatening lack of, of transparency of information and misinformation and genuine lack of information, lack of preparedness. Why? Because of the safety myth, myth. Japan is so technologically advanced its nuclear reactors are not going to fail, right? A lot of things, a lot of serious lessons Fukushima supposedly gave us. Um, at, at that point, the maximum number of evacuees said to be 16 million people. Um, oftentimes it was moms with their children. But anyway, there was a huge migration taking place all over Japan. Many of them came back weeks the no announcement that school was starting. Now, what kind of announcement is that? Like, the most important thing then is to start school on time. Um, there are mothers who have regretted responding um, like the Pavlovian dog to the announcement school is starting. Got to be get back. I don't know if it's safe to go back, but got to get back. So many, many people came back. And I remember talking to one young woman, a single mom, several years later, and she said, yeah, I came back too, and I think I came back like everybody else. The main reason is we didn't have the economic support to stay away because the evacuation zones were defined so narrowly, as I mentioned earlier. So I'd like you to think about those the, the frantic days um, when we really couldn't think about what was happening, but we can reflect on it. You can find online images, startling images from those days. But think about the fact that those startling images created a reality that pertain today, despite like one of the many declarations of the disaster being over um, on uh, in December of 2011, that same year, the then prime minister saying, yes, we have a cold shutdown and paving the way for the Olympics. OK, now I'm going to go back to my screen. And because I would like you to. Yeah, why? this is a, um, a wonderful, whoops, sorry, a wonderful, uh, I, I give the, um, the URL and it will also be in the links that we're sharing on the Columbia Riverkeeper website to emphasize how Fukushima isn't just about Fukushima and we're not even looking at the ocean, right? Which of course, one of the many, many things people say is Japan got lucky, the prevailing winds were such for the most of the first days when all those uh, reactors were exploding to send the major part of the plume out into the Pacific Ocean and around the world, right? However, it did turn, the winds did turn at early on, meaning that a great deal of Japan, so this is in 2011, got exposed of north, mm, northeastern to almost mm, getting around to central. Here's Tokyo about Japan. Um, here is Fukushima. You can see the con concentrations. This is only um, two isotopes of cesium, 137 and 134. 137 has a longer half-life, 30 years, and 134 is two years. But what is distinctive about this effort is that it is measuring soil. Measuring soil is a crucial part of monitoring um, the, um, the degree of contamination and our risk of exposure. It's something the Japanese government has been extremely reluctant to do um, because they just rather measure air where things move around faster and it's easier to say how much um, you know background uh, radiation is no different from the major capitals of the world, et cetera, et cetera. This site um, is um, is a citizen citizen site. 
and they developed a protocol for how to uh, dig the soil and how to package it, how to measure it. I shared it with uh, someone who's a professional in this in this area, and he said that's exactly how he would do it too. So I think they've done a very good job. And this little map that is too small for you to see, uh, but it's from um, um, the contamination uh, after Chernobyl. And in case you don't know it, um, that reactor uh, disaster contaminated more of Belarus than Ukraine itself, where the reactor is related. And there was also contamination in Russia. But in Belarus, the government made this kind of map um, uh, measuring the soil and then also anticipating what what the with um, half time passing, what those same areas would look like in 2056. So 10 years later, and then um, what 50 years later, more than that. Um, and this is the mo this was the model for this these people. Um, we're right about here right now. So you can still see that there's quite a bit of soil contamination in different parts of Japan. And I go with uh, the view of the linear no threshold um, standard that the National Academy of Sciences adopted many years ago, that there is no level of radiation below which we can say there will be no health effects. So depending on you, you know, the individual and the weather and all kinds of circumstances, there is no safety that can be guaranteed as long as uh, we are around radionuclides. Okay. And now I wanted to talk about water and um, uh, pollution, all the things that have been happening. The water is very big news. Um, because Japan is getting ready to uh, dump this contaminated water in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the Japanese government will go after foreign media who say contaminated water or radioactive water. They want to force international media to refer to it as treated water, treated wastewater. I think Accurately, we could say treated contaminated wastewater because that is exactly what it is. Um, so let me first, um, I just talk about our two kinds of forests generated, the forest of the tanks of contaminated water and the forest of the, um, you can think of this, a lot of this is yard waste that everyone at least um, if, you, if you're around yards, everyone knows about, placed in these flexible container bags. Um, so in terms of why there is so much water, this won't necessarily make it crystal clear, but let's just say there are three sources of water. And this is not the first time Japan will be uh, releasing water. It's been happening all along. There was a huge amount of dump that was dumped very early on. Um, and there's been leakage from those tanks. It's, so this is this is not the first time, but this is the first time that it's being announced as deliberate policy. So, and Norma, can I just ask a question here? Sure. Uh, and I, I think I asked you this when we first started preparing for this interview: is that mm -hmm. Fukushima has been has been leaking all along, and yes. that the ocean comes in, runs through the the destroyed reactor. So it's constantly being the, the the exposed reactor core or whatever's left there is constantly exposed to the sea and constantly being bathed in the sea. Well, it's right? it's um well, I don't know how much the tide, which is what you're talking about in a way, mm -hmm. influences it. But first of all, because of the way the reactor was constructed, they did it on the cheap. They cut off a huge part of a cliff to lower the um, site of the reactor itself so that it would be easier to transport construction equipment, which interrupted um, the aquifer, and meaning that there's groundwater that is always going, right. flowing into the basement yeah. of the reactor. So you that <clears throat> they've tried to do this frozen wall, my 
goodness, talk about expense to freeze. It never really worked. It was hugely expensive and it takes up a huge amount of guess what? Electricity um, to maintain a frozen wall. It was to cut off groundwater from entering and being exposed to the, um, the debris and all the <clears throat> contaminated parts of, of, the, of, of, the, of the reactors. And then there is, yes, rain. That's also going on. And then because these reactors are so, um, the, what remains of the react, the debris, all of that is still so hot. It's constant, it, there's water, seawater is used for that, um, deliberately used for that to use as a coolant for um, the reactor, for the, the fuel that's in there, the debris that's in there. And they try to recycle it. <clears throat> and a lot of it is then um, stored in these tanks, which TEPCO claims um, they're getting filled up, you know, so many over a thousand tons, met, and then over a thousand of these tanks, there's no more space. Citizens groups um, with expert members have said, no, no, you, the best thing would be to just keep them in place or um, and, and not to evaporate or put into the ocean, but wait for the half-life to be reduced. And there are large, large tanks in which oil is stored that can be used. Excuse me, there is um, uh, mortarization, which has been used in the Savannah River site. And I think there's another solution that has been proposed, but TEPCO and the government decided, no, the only realistic thing is to put it in the ocean. We will, um, we will of course, dilute it. We will have removed all radionuclides other than tritium because it's a form of water. It just has an extra hydrogen atom. And so we can't separate water from water. Um, there are experts who will, and, and, and the going line is tritium really isn't harmful. However, tritium forms um, bonds, does, uh, is part of organic, biological bonding that can break apart um, molecules that are essential to our normal body functioning. So I think we need to be skeptical about the claim that tritium is harmless, A, and B, TEPCO had been lying until 2018. They said trit tritium was the only thing that would be left when they got through. But in fact, there's 62 other radionuclides that were going to be left, including carbon-14 and strontium-90. Um, and um, this was a, a, a media organization that called them on their lie. And they said, oh, yes, yes, yes. But you know, we'll run it through again. And we'll make sure that there's nothing left other than tritium. But I think they also recently said that this is another very effective trick. Um, we're, we're just going to monitor 30 of those radionuclides, 30 of the 62 that were identified. Um, and so we'll make sure those aren't around. Well, what happened to the other 32? We'll see. So there are many, many problems and, um, about releasing this water into the ocean and, and, and just going to one of yuki's concerns when we were talking about this is that once this tunnel release once this tunnel is created for this release of, of tank waste it's it will be an ongoing tunnel they'll it will be a continual release that we'll probably never know about which really chilled chilled me to the bone you know it's obvious in a way but i hadn't thought about that so and, and, and also, I'd like all of us to be thinking about the radiation exposed la labor that is going to that is going into creating this tunnel and everything else that's happening, that none, none of this happens without people being exposed, right? People considered expendable, workers considered expendable. Um, so with that, on that cheery note, let's move to the soil. Um, Japan, the government of Japan uh, promised the people of Fukushima that all of this would be moved by 2045 outside the prefecture. I think it was, it was expedient and deceptive and reckless because think again of the exposed labor and by the way, huge expense that went into 
decontaminating soil. I might say that one contrast we could make between Chernobyl and Fukushima is that this is a gross comparison, but in gen we couldn't say that in Chernobyl, many, many human beings were moved away from contamination and the contamination was kept in place. In Fukushima, people are kept in place and the contamination is moved around. Because think about it, with these half-lives that we're talking about, you're not decontaminating, you're just locomoting, you're transporting uh, contamination um, and you're not supporting people to move away and stay away until it is safer. Um, these, these bags, pretty expensive on their own, um, were guaranteed to last three to five years. Of course they didn't, but as you can see, a lot of work went into making these bags to filling them up and piling them and moving them around. And what's happening now is that they're, um, the government, that, that the, the waste is being taken out of these bags and standards are being changed so that bags can be, the contents can be reused, moved around and reused. It is truly amazing that effort went into consolidating contaminated materials and now effort and expense, again, with exposure on the part of the people doing this, um, to scatter it around. It's truly dismaying. Okay. Um, so one of the big things um, to keep in mind is the theme is recovery reconstruction. That is what is going, that is the, the watchword and anybody going against that um, is persona non grata, by which I mean uh, mothers who were worried about having local milk as part of their children's school lunches or mothers worried about um, outdoor activities. Think about softball, right? Sliding into base. What are you doing? Kicking up a lot of dirt. What do you do with that dirt? You're going to breathe it in, right? The possibility of inhaling radionuclides, um, of eating it, of drinking it, of having cuts on your skin, on your shins, when you're engaging in sports, all of that to give voice to those worries um, is to stir up anxiety in your fellow mothers, your neighbors. It is not welcome. It is um, the process of silencing of victims by fellow victims. That is one of the most painful aspects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, where the people who have suffered dare not give expression to their suffering because they feel helpless. Okay, and one of the vehicles for operationalizing this is to find inspiration in Hanford. The Han Hanford, right? One of, well, often called the most radioactively contaminated place in North America. I think it could have some competition for that, but it certainly is very contaminated. Lo and behold, um, there are Japanese experts and politicians who decide, aha, uh -huh, let's turn to Hanford as a model for our recovery. Um, they started on this in 2014, just three years after the disaster happened, which makes me think that some people were thinking right away about what they could do, what they could get out of Hanford. They call it the Innovation Coast Framework, the Hanford Tridec model. We have delegations going to um, uh, Hanford, um, visiting the site, going to Pacific Northwest Labs, et cetera. We have delegations coming from there. They want to do um, university student exchanges. Um, they want to um, they want to turn that disaster site, the coastal site of Fukushima, into the high-tech uh, capital, not just of Japan, but even of the world, to make Japan a leader 
in that sense. So as I said, I'll put on the slide, within the framework, projects will be realized in the fields of robotics, energy, decommissioning, agroforestry, and fisheries, form industrial clusters, foster human resources, increase tourism. And this Japanese site, I just translated um, this right-hand block over here. It says the key words describing Hanford development um, I think they're talking mostly about Richland. Salaries are high, cost of living is low, and schools are good. There you've got it. We have our model. Let's go. It is quite amazing. The money that's flowing in there, you can see it. I think we can, the robotics and, and many other aspects of it, people are pretty sure are going to be feeding into um, military purposes. Um, let's remember that Japan still has a constitution that has a no war clause. Um, but um, because I firmly believe that the original separation between nuclear technology for weapons and nuclear technology for um, electricity generation was, an, was a, um, an instrumental one, Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace, a brilliant, brilliant sales pitch. Um, but it's the same technology joint at, at their core, and the one can easily slide into the other. So I, it is not surprising that many people who have examined the, the, the Innovation Coast framework are suspecting um, military use as, as one of the things that will come out of this. This quickly, I wanted to show you the soft part of this Innovation Coast. This is a new school in one of the cities um, that was off limits for a long time. People haven't been moving back. They're trying so hard to attract people. So this isn't about robotics or any anything like that, but this is still a model. It's a school that's gonna open. It's gonna open in April, but in temporary headquarters because it's not ready yet. So far, the construction costs are $33 million, but that is calculated in today's yen dollar exchange and the yen is very low right now in relation to the um, dollar. So $33 million to construct the super duper school that may have 25 students. It's accepting ages of zero to 15. And they've got this wonderful dream, you know, name for it. It's a dream forest house of learning. And it's going to have this kind of innovative, individualized, educational program that would be the dream of progressive parents anywhere in Japan. I mean, like this is the most progressive education you can imagine. And it seems like you have to have sub been subjected to a nuclear disaster to have access to have this kind of education. It's so ironic. I can't, I can't begin to tell you the depths of the irony if I also tell you that instruction, school instruction in Fukushima and all of Japan, it's a very centralized education system, has been all about saying, you know what, we didn't have it so bad. And these levels of exposure are really not serious. So a lot, a successive series of supplemental textbooks have been produced by the education ministry really to erase the notion that the levels of exposure constitute any kind of risk. Um, a very different way to look at it is by, in the words of Dr. Um, Hisako Sakiyama, who was on the diet, the parliamentary investigating committee, and who funds one of the organizations that Laura mentioned earlier, the 3.11 Fund for Children with Thyroid Cancer. She says, these children have to live, they're going to grow up on contaminated land. In order to protect their own health, they need honest information. That is exactly what the government does not want. Okay, and then I wanna finish up with this, um, what Laura started with, this forgetting that it happened, making us forget that it ever happened. The GX, mysterious name, the Green Transformation Bill, which is going to amend all these fundamental laws that have governed 
um, electricity production. And let me take this opportunity to remind you that the electricity produced at the Fukushima Daiichi was never for the people of Fukushima. It was shipped, it was transported over very, very long um, high powered lines to Tokyo. So this electricity never ever served the residents of Fukushima. But anyway, they're going to amend all these laws and in the, in the name of decarbonization, because the Ukrainian, Ukraine war energy crisis makes everyone around the world worried about energy source. And before that, we have had climate change to justify turning towards nuclear. So now these two things are being exploited by the Japanese government to say, guess what? We really need to restart and keep on using all those reactors that we stopped until they could pass the new more stringent safety tests. We're going to change the laws, so we're gonna restart them. In order to make all of this go smoother, we're going to change the government agency that handles these. Because it was understood that the previous regulator was also the promoter of nuclear energy, what we call regulatory capture, it's not unknown here in the US or elsewhere, they set up a new independent agency. How independent it was, I think, is quite questionable. Nevertheless, it was independent. It was too independent, it was thought, to oversee this nuclear restart, license extension, and the hope of building new ones, the new super duper ones, including SMRs that you've heard about. So lots and lots of um, drastic measures are going to be presented to the parliament. And since the opposition is not organized, um, I don't know. I don't wanna say it can't change. Maybe citizen protest will become visible enough. Have to see, but it is really such a disrespect for the people who have experienced this disaster and such a disrespect really for the, for the earth, certainly for the Northern hemisphere. Okay, I wanted us to end with um, memorable words. Um, so I wanted us to hear from people who've experienced this disaster. Um, and the first one um, is this young man who was then 16, someone who evacuated. And this was before Pope Francis when he came to Japan in 2016. And um, Laura is going to read um, the words that in his very short speech that he delivered before the Pope and um, a smallish but substantial audience. So Laura, if you'll tell us Matsuki's words, if, she'll, if you'll share them with us. Yes, thank you, Norma. Dear Holy Father, the nuclear disaster occurred when I was eight and our family fled to Tokyo to escape exposure to the radioactivity being released. Then my father left us in our mother's care and went back to Fukushima. Being a school teacher, he had students that he needed to protect as well. Mother seeking refuge had to move from one unfamiliar place to another with my three-year-old brother and me. At night, my brother would get under the covers and cry from loneliness. I was bullied at our evacuation sites and the days that passed were so hard that I even wanted to die. Eventually, father quit his job, his mind and body wrecked. Still, I think we're among the lucky ones to have been able to evacuate the government even stopped providing us with housing. I'm desperately trying to stay on, but many people had no choice but to return to a contaminated land. The radioactive materials that rained far and wide in Eastern Japan continue to emit radiation now, eight years later. But the contaminated earth and forest to return to what they were will take many, time, many times my lifespan. We are the ones who will go on living here. That's why I think adults have the responsibility of telling us about the exposure and the contamination, about the damages that might occur in the future without hiding anything. I don't want them to die ahead of us, leaving us with their lies, never having acknowledged what happened. Nuclear power generation is national policy. 
That's why the government wanting to sustain it set compensation amounts and defined evacuation zones that led to divisions among the victims. People who were hurting were set upon each other in hatred. It is impossible to convey our suffering. Therefore, Your Holiness, please pray with us that we may awaken to each other's pain and recover our neighborly love. That however cruel the reality, we be given the courage to not avert our eyes. That courage may be given to the powerful so that they can acknowledge their errors and repent. That we may all together overcome the damage that has been done to us. That all the people of the world may start to work together to remove the threat of radiation exposure from our future. Please pray with us. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Matsuki is now in college. I think um, he's becoming more and more an effective spokesperson, but you can see how much he captured of the contours and substance of this disaster. Um, what was the church's, what was the Pope's response to that or the church's response? Any idea of? of, well, of um, the, the Vatican has long condemned nuclear weapons. And I have read that its position was to support Adams for Peace uh, nuclear power. However, um, I have read that the Pope, Pope Francis, on the flight to China, where he was going next, I guess, had said that the position, uh, the church's position on nuclear power really needed to be reconsidered. But I haven't read that as an official statement from the Vatican. However, the Catholic Church in Japan has been very outspoken in opposing nuclear power from early on in the Fukushima nuclear disaster um, and showing you know, the things that we learn from studying um, our Southwest about uranium mines um, that um, the, so the Catholic Church in Japan early it showed me one of the first diagrams I've seen about how nuclear power is carbon free only at that narrow moment of electricity generation and otherwise from mining uranium to refining and transport and then handling everything afterwards that that some that it requires somebody to somebody's many many people to be exposed to radiation all along the way. And therefore, why would we want to be engaged in a power generation practice that's harmful to so many of our fellow humans? I hope, I hope the Catholic Church in Japan can become more influent, influential, more better heard throughout um, to, to Catholics the world over. But, but thank you so much for thinking to ask that question. I'm also told that when Matsuki met Pope Francis on this occasion, he had earlier met him um, at the Vatican and his Sunday coming out meet and greet occasions. And the Pope said to Matsuki, do you remember me? We met each other before. And he, he was so startled to be asked by the Pope, do you remember me? Okay, next I want to go to this other um, child thyroid cancer. It is the only cancer that the nuclear the international nuclear powers have recognized as having been caused by the Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster. It took 10 years for them to do that. And they denied it and denied it and denied it. And you can read about it in, in the historian Kate Brown's wonderful book, a Manual for Survival, about how the nuclear powers attempted to disguise that. Now the Japanese government, I think, wants to do better. It wants to say, yeah, maybe in Chernobyl, but really not here. The levels were too low, thyroid cancer. Yes, we recognize there's a can there are cancer clusters that we have a huge, you know, um, tens to hundreds of times the norm of child thyroid cancer that happened. But guess what? It wasn't caused by the disaster. And many, many uh, kinds of, um, oh, flimsy reasons have been given. Like, um, in Chernobyl, it looked, took longer than five years. Well, they weren't able to measure before five years in Chernobyl. All kinds of things 
that experts who have looked into this um, can show to be rather shockingly thin reasons for denying. You know, um, at the very least, the scientific attitude might be to say, we're not sure. That's why we have to keep on looking. But instead, the government, um, which has had a monitoring program, screening program for people under 18 and under in 2011, has done everything it can to reduce the scope of that program, even to saying it causes unnecessary anxiety. Talk about patronizing, right? We're causing needless anxiety to parents and children of Fukushima by having, by encouraging thyroid screening. So nevertheless, we have over 300 um, thyroid, acknowledged thyroid cancer cases. And last year, six young plaintiffs and now seven young plaintiffs have decided to take TEPCO to court. This is the first time this has happened. Really to say, to frontally pursue the issue of exposure and exposure related ills, uh, to pursue it in the courts. They have to do it anonymously for the reasons I mentioned earlier, because it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't contribute to the uh, announcements of reconstruction recovery to say people got thyroid cancer from it. It's not even welcomed by their neighbors. So these very brave young people, and their devoted team of attorneys and supporters have worked very, very hard to protect their identities. And I just wanted to give you a taste of what it's like. Well, um, recent, very fine translation of sorry, a plaintiff who's. Um, whose thyroid cancer was identified through this prefectural screening. And um, she was diagnosed while in high school. She already, she had a very quick recurrence when she went to college. Um, she's, so after the two recurrences, it was found that the cancer had metastasized to her lungs. Something I would like you to be on the lookout for. Many, many people say thyroid cancer, if you have to get a cancer, it's one of the good cancers to get. Well, it seems to work differently in young people. I don't know that any cancer is a good cancer to get, but the um, assumptions that people make certainly need to be scrutinized when we're talking about early age exposure. So she has had to undergo something called radioisotope treatment where she takes in radioactive iodine in an effort to deal with the lesions, the tumors and her lungs. It's a very hard treatment in that you have to be completely isolated. No one can help you through the nausea, the pain, the discomfort, even young children. This is not how it's done in the US because there's a physician I'm told um, in the in like around 2006 who persuaded the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that it doesn't need to be uh, regulating the medical uh, nuclear medicine. But in any case, it's being very strictly done in Japan. Um, and so she's isolated for three days. She's vomiting all the time. Um, she bursts blood vessels in her eye and, and no human being steps in to help her because it would expose the doctors and hospital staff. And it's only after her, she's monitored and her levels are low enough that she's allowed to leave the hospital. She has to get rid of everything she wore. Um, and, you know, in this whole lead encased room. And after that, um, it's hard for her to swallow because it did something to her salivary glands. And she says that hospitalization experience was the harshest yet. I don't want to have to go through it again. I went through such a painful experience and yet the treatment didn't work that well. It didn't do what it was supposed to. And I ended up feeling like it was all a waste. Before I was motivated to get treatment with the assumption that it would cure me. Now I just think, I hope this treatment at least slows down the progression of my illness. Um, of course, I didn't actually want to give up on college. I wanted to graduate. I wanted to start working in a field I'm good at. I wanted to be carefree and chat with my friends. I wanted to experience college life. 
These are all dreams that didn't come true, and it's hard to let them go. The friends I went to middle and high school with have already graduated, started working, and they're leading stable new lives. I can't help looking at them with envy. It's hard because I don't want to feel this sort of resentment toward them. It's painful to see medical students at the hospital who are about the same age as me. I end up thinking I should be a college student too. Every time I go to the hospital, I think, I hope the tumor marker value hasn't gone up. But lately, the value is higher every time I go and I get crushed. What did I do wrong? Why is the number higher? My overall health has been declining and I struggle with social, sore shoulders, lower back pain, fatigue, and hands and feet that quickly go numb. I don't know if it's because of the excessive amount of medication I have to take, but I get heart palpitations or feel like I'm suffocating. The area of my neck where I got surgery also cramps very easily. And when that happens, I just have to endure the pain until it subsides. I feel bad whenever I think about how much I've burdened my family because she can't get enroll in special cancer insurance having already been diagnosed with it and how much I've made them worry because of my illness. I don't want to cause them any more pain. I want to return to my old body. But as much as I pray for that, I will never get it back. Through this trial, I hope that thyroid cancer patients are able to get proper compensation. And this is something that all the plaintiffs and the lawyers say, that one purpose, that all of these plaintiffs are motivated not just for themselves, to have assurances that they will have support for their futures, but they wanted to, to get um, assurances of health care and support for all the other 200 or close to 300 um, people who were children um, at the time the disaster started, because it's not over, they keep saying they want to do it for the ones who can't speak out and join the lawsuit. So that is, it's inspiring, right? When you think you can do good for other people too, and not just be working for yourself, as, although that is so much justified in this case. And then fine, whoops, why can't I go to the next one? Hmm. Okay, my last major slide, lots and lots of trials. There is only one criminal trial, by which I mean the state finally has decided to charge three TEPCO um, executives with responsibility for having what it comes down to is underestimated um, earthquake and tsunami warm warnings from the experts of the country in the early 2000s and having saved money and not raised the seawall. Um, that is a crucial part of what made this disaster so bad. There are other, there's a nuclear power plant down the coast where these procedures had been taken where this flooding didn't take place and loss of coolant and all the other disastrous uh, things that the necessary scenario when you lose coolant at a nuclear power plant. So this is the, this, these are the complainants that um, Laura was referring to earlier with the head, uh, Rui Komuto, who is absolutely one of my heroes in the world. And, and I had to apologize to her many times for saying, I have to thank for the disaster for having been able to meet you. Um, but it is true. And they had, these citizens had to work very, very hard to insist that somebody be held accountable for the disaster. It hasn't happened yet. The case is going to the Supreme Court. But I want to, um, I want to hear, I have to make this, um, I want to just read to you, um, I think they're her words, although they're given as the complainant statement about the, the core of this complaint. So in charging another with a crime, we must also scrutinize how we have lived our lives. Still, we believe this is a profoundly meaningful step. We question a society which does not cherish each person who lives in this country, which imposes sacrifices on the part of some. We who have been divided and torn apart by the accident will once again come together and expand our circle. 
we who have been hurt and thrust into despair will recover our strength and dignity. This, we think, is how we can fulfill our responsibilities to our children and to our young people. I think this is not just the core of the movement to have a criminal trial, not a lawsuit, but a criminal trial in which the state has indicted these defendants. But I think it's the core of the whole movement. Um, it's about how we live and having a society in which everyone is honored as a human being and respected as a human being. So um, let's see, uh, some actions. I think um, Laura's gonna go into that, but um, let me talk, I will exit. Should I exit, Laura? Yeah, that would be fine. I mean, okay. just stop the PowerPoint. That was yeah, I'm just going to stop the PowerPoint. Don't, don't go away. Don't you go away. No, I'm not going away yet. I just wanted to say a little bit about, you know, what I think the point of all this. I mean, first of all, I hope you can feel from the words that Laura and I have shared with you that the disaster is hardly over. And it's not really not over for anyone because that's how radioactivity works. Um, we have the long-lived radionuclides in the environment and our bodies, delayed manifestation of illness, especially where we're talking about internal exposure. This is often deliberately confused. People tell you it's like taking a, an airplane flight from New York to, I don't know, Portland, Seattle. Well, that's not a picnic either if you're a pilot or um, someone who works um, on flights but that is external exposure, meaning the source of the radiation is outside your body. But once you take it in, it's a whole new ball game because you have the radionuclides, radiation bombarding your innards and how can you get away from your own internal organs? You can work at it, hard to get it out of your lungs though. So think about that. Let's think about the workers who are always being exposed. Um, and let's think about how insecure that site is. Area that's had major earthquakes, sometimes they're called aftershocks. We've heard about that in Turkey and Syria too, most recently. And aren't we glad that the um, nuclear power plant being built um, by uh, Russia in Turkey had not yet, um, the, the fuel rods hadn't been loaded yet, although the earthquake wasn't didn't reach that area, but it could, it could have. Turkey also is prone to that. So we've had that recent lesson about the earthquake square scare. It's always going on, Ty typhoons in Japan. There are many, many, it, that site is not secure. Things rattle around. I had a worker explain that to me. You get one pipe from Toshiba, another from Hitachi, another from Mitsubishi. This shocked me, but apparently there isn't fine level standardization. So remember in, a rhythm in math that we learned, oh, if it's over 0.5, you round up. Well, apparently these companies don't necessarily have the same practice of rounding up their decimals. So there's subtle, subtle differences in, for example, metal pipes that fit into each other. So an earthquake can easily exploit that subtle difference. That's what one long-term nuclear worker explained to me, and I, I was shocked, frankly. But a lot of that has already gone on. People have had to be exposed. TEPCO has said, oh, we'll only do that maneuver remotely. Well, right away they found that the robots couldn't do it. So they had to send human beings up to this high exposure uh, ventilation pipe. Um, also, we, we're the, dismissing the sufferers and the citizens who are working so hard to oppose restart, rebuild, dumping the water and spreading the contaminated soil around, I think is, is, is very harmful to the democratic process itself. And that's in Japan. And then internationally, if we think about people in the Pacific, its neighbors, Korea and China, who do also have nuclear power, I think it perpetuates power relations that are consistent with colonialism and imperialism. And that is also very harmful in itself. And I'm hoping for those of you who listen to us today, that you think about the role of nuclear power and nuclear we weapons production and testing in your own com communities, 
and in the Pacific Northwest, please think about how Hanford is enabling a massive, expensive cover-up in Fukushima. Thank you. I pass it on to you, Laura. Wow, Norma, my goodness. So yeah, the question is, what, what actions can we take? And I think you just alluded to that, Norma. What, what's happening here that's connected to Fukushima and all other nuclear sites, really? And here, though we had the wonderful news of Columbia River Keeper and other efforts stopping the siting of um, a small modular reactor at Hanford, which which is you know a, a huge little a huge little piece of sanity. Um, we're also battling right now um, efforts in both the Oregon and Washington legislatures to build small modular reactors everywhere. And Oregon has a history, as we know, of not allowing this. So please be aware of HB House Bill 2215 in Oregon and House Bill 1584 in Washington. It's really a new scale onslaught to make us go nuclear. Laura, um, do you despite... want to repeat those numbers again? Because people yeah. might have wanted to write them down and didn't realize it till afterwards. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, in Oregon, House Bill 2215, they just had a hearing about that bill. And some of the testimony is, is very wonderful if you want to go and, and look into that on their website, on the, on the um, legislature's website. And in Washington, it's House Bill 1584. And sadly, I learned just um, recently that it's already passed the House. So we really need to be aware of these things, you know. Um, and do what we can. This is this is our neighborhood, if you will. So that's one thing. Be informed. Stay informed. We need to we need to do it. And um, on this on this twelfth anniversary of Fukushima, the Manhattan the Manhattan Project for Nuclear Free World is um, doing doing an event. Um, because they're also battling the dumping of wastewater into the Hudson, if you can believe it. They've also been leading the charge, um, one of the charges to stop this dump from Fukushima, this release of, of water from Fukushima. And um, they have a postcard project where you can contact um, politicians in Fukushima Prefecture and that website, that postcard project, where you can send postcards to these particular politicians, um, will be um, on the blog for you to, to look at. Um, you can also, another thing you can do, you can donate to the 311 Fund for Children with Thyroid Cancer. That website is also included, um, will be included on the blog. and. Also the lawsuit, there's a link for contributing to the lawsuit that Norma just spoke of. Um, those are important, really tangible things we can do. Um, so I guess also there's a, there's um, for this 12th, and there's a global response to this um, 12th anniversary and you can find that on Facebook, Anniversary of Fukushima Nuclear Accident Events and Actions. And it'll show you globally how people are pushing back and we need to be part of that. And you, we all need to be part of that in any way that we can. Um, so in closing, I just want to thank Columbia Riverkeeper again for giving us this platform for Norma to share because as you can see, she's, she knows so much. She's truly a Fukushima expert and, and I'm, I'm just grateful for her knowledge and that she's so willing and gracious to share it. Um, I think that's, oh, and the Q&A, don't forget, if you have questions for Norma, she shared a lot with us, please submit them to Simone at ColumbiaRiverkeeper.org. And what else, Norma? I think, I think, yes. Um, well, so please look at the blog because um, Laura and I put quite a bit of thought into additional resources for you to check out. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that's huge. But Laura, the most immediate thing um, that you you wanted to emphasize is stay informed. That's a huge, huge thing that we can be doing at our desks all the time. 
to to I think for people Fukushima people who suffer these disasters, the they really don't want to be forgotten. They don't want their disaster to be forgotten, which is really truly our disaster too. Um, so yeah, Laura, I appreciate your having emphasized that over and over, and I just want to remind you and everybody else of that action we can take. And me too. I want to thank the Columbia Riverkeeper and. Laura, thank you so, so much. Oh, Norma, it's been such a pleasure. It's been such an absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Same for me and all of you. Please take care of yourselves and each other. That's the spirit mm -hmm. of the Fukushima complainants too, is we have to all join hands and try to protect each other so and, and, and incur, enlarge that circle of protection. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank bye. you, everyone.